All right, so today we'll continue with the work that we were doing before on property plant equipment and intangibles um, acquisition. And um, I will also, I guess, even now, I'll remind you, let me just go back here quickly. Even now, it's time to remember that um, your homework for chapter nine is due today. Um, yeah, Monday, October the 18th, your chapter nine homework is due at 6 p.m. It's been available for some time and we have finished chapter nine, you know, the week um, before the holiday. So um, well, we just wrapped it up basically at that point. So you've had time to do it. I hope everyone will finish it. Remember, it counts 3% towards your overall grade. It's all available um, on McGraw. Hill, connect. I think everybody knows that already. If for some reason you're still uh, stranded in that confusion that we had, or some people had at the beginning of the semester, if um, there's like a landing page for some of you that does that only shows like no homework due within the next seven days or something, you just have to click. I'll click on the top, drop down for classes and choose our class, and it shows you all the homework um, that's coming up. Um, Chapter nine should be showing as due anyway, because you're you're on the due date. So the chapter nine um, homework is due. You probably would have seen if you're checking your email, um, and I had said that I would send it out, uh, information about the test and the quiz. Um, I will go over this closer to the end of, of the class. I don't want to disrupt the situation now. I'll leave enough time for us to go over it, but basically just as a high, high line uh, announcement again, even though I did send out and you should have seen it again if you, if you checked your email, um, I did send out an announcement about test one and course one on Friday afternoon. And obviously also remind about the homework being due. If you are not receiving, these emails, um, it could be, I guess, many things, but at least two things I can think of is that um, you have uh, an email address attached to Blackboard that you're not checking. Um, so, or that's defunct or whatever. So please make sure that you know which email address is attached to Blackboard. The other thing is that you should also be checking your emails regularly anyway. Um, so you'll have a one week window um, in which you can take the test and the quiz on any one of those days, but before the, the deadline. And um, again, I'll go more into that uh, later on in the class. I don't want to um, spend too much time on that now. So, so again, today is the 18th and the chapter nine homework is due. Um, trying to think if there's any, if there are any other announcements I need to make. I don't think so at, at this time for, for you guys. So um, again, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, I will do my best to, to answer all your test and quiz questions. And remember, just because the test and the quiz open tomorrow doesn't mean you have to do it tomorrow. You can take however much time you need. You just have to give yourself enough time to finish it um, by six o'clock on the last day. All right, so last week, Wednesday, when we were together, we um, went through, you know, the cost of all of these assets. I won't belabor the point by going through all of them again. I'll just say that we finished up with cost of natural resources, and we specifically were talking about something like a mine um, that a company would buy or may buy, um, and that when it comes to to an asset like that, it could be other things, it could also be a timber forest, it could be um, any number of, of natural resources. But if we stick with this mining example, uh, there are four, um, I guess, costs that will be included in the cost of um, acquisition of this natural resource. So um, I'm going over this again because the next section that we'll speak about directly relates to this. So the acquisition cost of, of the natural resource is obviously going to be in, in the cost of the asset. Then we spoke about how, um, because it's a natural resource, there may be necessary exploration costs. Um, like for instance, this talks about an oil rig. So maybe you have to throw to get to the oil or you might have to excavate the mine. 
to see where you're going to drop the shops down, or whatever the case may be. So there are exploration costs. Remember, all of this is about um, the costs that are necessary to get to the asset, to the location and condition for its intended use, right? Then you've got development costs. They um, could be, uh, or they, the ones that are included are intangible development costs um, that, you know, it could be some type of planning, maps, whatever the case may be that are being drawn up, maybe an architect has to get involved and so on. Uh, but tangible equipment um, is not included in the development cost. Those assets are recorded separately um, and they will have their own depreciation and so on. We'll see later on in an example how that works. And then the last piece is uh, restoration costs. Uh, so the, the costs, and you know, I spoke to you about this also at length last time about how um, even where I'm from uh, in South Africa, there's a lot of mining that goes on. And um, in years gone by, the companies that used to mine, they, they didn't really restore the place back to how it was before they mined. And in fact, they left some of the mines uh, open. And in recent years, people have like, I guess, out of desperation of trying to get something, uh, you know, to feed themselves and their families, they've actually gone down into these mines to try and see if they could recover any type of uh, natural resources that they could sell. Um, whether it be gold, diamonds, and so on. And unfortunately, a lot of people have succumbed uh, in the mines because the, the place is, is not safe, it's unstable, or they go in and they can't come back out. So uh, the restoration cost is really about making sure that the, that the area, the property is back to uh, the state that it was, I mean, it can't really be the state that it was in, but at least close to the state that it was in when you first started, this is also applicable to oil wells. I mean, you can imagine if, if that's just left to, you know, to, I guess, be open that there could be oil spills and all kinds of stuff. So this restoration cost, um, ends up being a liability. Uh, it's called an assets retirement obligation. The word obligation should give you um, the notion, obviously, that it's a liability because today, if we decide to, you know, we decide to acquire this natural resource today, we have to make an estimate today of what it's going to cost us um, to restore this land um, at some point in the future. So we basically have to look at the present value um, of that cost and include that today as a liability. And we also include the present value in um, the cost of um, the asset, right? So you debit the asset and you credit a liability called assets retirement obligation. All right, so that's, that's um, the mind. We did this example. Remember, you guys have access to this document and we, we, um, we did example 16 and included acquisition costs, intangible development costs, and then the assets retirement obligation that was $80,000 to get to a cost of the mine of five eighty thousand. right? This is the refresher. And then we spoke a little bit about salvage value um, because the question said something along the lines of you're able to sell the mine at the end for 160,000. Um, that doesn't get included in the cost of the mine. That would be double counting because it's relating to the assets that have already been included. But you will, will um, subtract that amount from the cost of the mine in order to calculate depletion. And we'll run into that in chapter 11. All right, so that's, that's the cost of natural resources. And that's how those questions are generally asked. And so we come to... Um, Assets retirement obligations, which is digging now a little deeper into this notion of um, restoration costs, right? And so <clears throat> asset retirement obligations are going to be recognized uh, when, you know, the company has basically signed a contract or some type of document with an authority to say that, you know, when they retire the long-lived asset, which basically just means when they stop using the natural resource or whatever it is they're using, um, they will have to uh, restore, like I said, the land and they need to actually be able to estimate the amount. Um, there has to be an obligation and there has to be an amount that you can put to it in order to make that journal entry. 
gap. So, the, you know, the first B, they require that an ARO be recognized as a liability. And that's, uh, you know, that makes sense because you have an obligation today as a result of buying this asset um, that you will have to restore it in the future. So there's a present obligation as a result of a past event. Um, and you'll have to use, you know, future benefits will flow out of your business because you have to pay for it. So that falls right into the definition of a liability. Um, and also uh, it's measured at fair value, which is a present value. So you can't say, um, you know, that in five years time, I have to pay a million dollars to record, to, sorry, to restore this asset. Um, so I'm just gonna record a million dollars today. That's, that's not true because the million dollars in five years time is not the same as a million today because of the time value of money, which I'm sure you guys have run into um, this concept that maybe in 112 or 201 or in your finance classes or whatever, right? The, a, a, a dollar today is not the same as, you know, a dollar in, in a few years time. Uh, that's why people invest um, in the stock market. That's why, you know, if, if you borrow, you're going to pay interest and, and so on. They have, there's some um, differential between what something is worth today versus what it is worth um, in five years time or four years time or whatever in financial terms. So, you know, remember that when someone comes to you to ask you to borrow money that they only pay you back in, in six months or something, don't just give them your money, you know, interest, interest free, this, you know, to go off on a bit of a tangent, this also is, is shown even in the tax code, um, when people lend money to each other, like within families and stuff, and especially if it's a significant amount of money, and if they don't charge interest, um, the IRS will actually do what they call impute an interest amount on the transaction, which then has to be recognized as income by the person who is loaning the money, even if they did not receive or charge any kind of interest in that transaction. So that tells us that there is obviously, a, you know, value to having money in your pocket today versus tomorrow or next year. So when we record the asset retirement um, obligation, we today we will look at what is the value today of that amount amount that we have to pay out in, you know, in five years time. So a million in five years time is going to be less than a million today, because the amount will grow over time based on whatever the interest rate is. Now, obviously, the interest rate these days is, is pretty low. Um, we all know that. Um, the Fed has kept the interest rate uh, almost, you know, close to to zero, um, you know, that this is the lending, their lending rate with banks and so on. Even if you buy a property or something, the mortgage rate is super low. Um, and part of that is, is, you know, it's part of the measures to try to keep the economy going, especially during COVID times. But what that also means is, um, you know, if you are trying to invest by just earning interest over time, you're not really returning a lot of money. In our example, I don't know if you guys have ever used the, the fair value tables or present value tables, but I'll show you how to use the table to figure out um, what present value factor basically we will use to calculate what's, what an amount that has to be paid out in, I think in one of the examples, it's in four years time, what that amount is going to translate to today. It's an important um, thing to remember, it comes up in business all the time, this notion of a present value. You can also do it in the other direction. You can say future value. So if you say I have $500 today, I want to know what it's going to be worth in 10 years time. If I'm earning, you know, 3% interest, you can also calculate uh, an amount in the future, not just, you know, an amount, bringing back an amount to the present. And so um, once we calculate this liability uh, using, in our case, we'll use present value tables. Um, you know, some of you may go off and even study finance, uh, and accounting or finance instead of accounting, my majors are both finance and accounting. So I know in addition to the tables that we have in the textbook, you can also use a formula 
um, or you can use you know a, a financial calculator to to calculate this amount um, either way it's going to come to the same amount and once you calculate the liability you credit obviously the liability it's called asset retirement obligation and you debit the asset because it's part of the cost of getting the asset to the location and the condition um, necessary for its intended use. The, they can't use the asset until they've agreed that they will restore um, the, the earth or whatever they're, they're messing up to extract the stuff. Um, and then over time, um, you know, the, the, the cost of, of this obligation, which is part of the asset, will obviously be expensed as, as part of, it, of um, depreciation expense. And the liability will grow over time until um, on the date when they're supposed to pay, uh, the liability on the books will be same as, uh, the same as the amount that they have to pay out. Um, any questions? I know. Uh, this may not be the, um, you know, it may be news to some people, but maybe for others, it's it's pretty easy to follow. Does anybody have anything that they want to ask me about this? All right, so, um, We'll do number 10 right now. I'll do it with you. Number 10 um, doesn't ask us to calculate um, the present value. It actually just gives us the present value. But then I have another question. I believe it's um, number 19 in the, in the documents that I gave you. That actually does ask you to go to the, you know, the tables and, and figure out what the what the present value is. So I'm gonna go back to this uh, Google doc. Remember all these things are available um, under Zoom notes and examples. If you wanna follow along um, in the Google doc, you can just click on this link. If you want to, oops, sorry. If you wanna see the notes, they're over here and the rest is, is kind of, um, sorry, over here. The rest is kind of, uh, all the answers to questions, but some of them are um, on Word docs and some are in Excel. So it's a little bit um, of a mixed bag. But at the end of, of this chapter, all the solutions will be on this document as well. And I am marking them, even though we're not doing the examples in order, I'm marking them so that you'd be able to follow. So let's read um, example 10 and see if we can figure out what we need to do here. All right. So Caliph drillers erects and places into service an offshore oil platform, so it's a natural resource, right? Um, on January the 1st, 2013, at a cost of $10 million. Caliph is legally required to dismantle and remove the platform at the end of its useful life in 10 years. So there's the asset retirement obligation, right? To dismantle and remove the platform and it's gonna be in 10 years time. Calif estimates it will cost a million dollars to dismantle and remove the platform at the end of its useful life in 10 years. So that's the future value, right? Of, of the, um, like that's the cost that it's going to be in the future. We cannot record that today. Right, because the liability today is not a million, it's the present value of a million dollars. So, so fair value in this case is the same meaning as present value because it's saying what's the value today. The fair value of January the 1st, 2013 of the dismantle and removal cost is 450,000. So again, what this is saying is, a uh, million dollars in 10 years time is the same as 450,000 today. And that 450,000 will grow over time until it becomes a million dollars uh, of a liability on your books. So they asked to prepare the entry to record the asset retirement obligation. So remember what we said that in the theory, we said that the asset is debited um, because the retirement obligation is part of the cost of, of getting the asset to the point where you can use it. And then you credit the asset retirement obligation. So that's basically, oops, sorry, that's not what I'm looking for. That's basically what we're going to do now, All right? So let me put this like this. So it's a simple journal entry, debit, oops, debit and credit. 
and you're basically just saying oil platform or however or oil rig, however you want to call the asset. Let me mark it as an asset so you understand when you look back at this, what's going on. And it's 450,000. And then again, the credit, very simple. The credit goes to asset retirement obligation. And if you're following the question, again, we don't put the million in here. We put the 450,000, which is, you know, if you have 450,000 today, they're saying it's going to grow over time, um, depending on the interest rate and so on, which they don't mention because we don't need it, but it's going to grow over time to a million dollars in 10 years time. Questions, anybody or comments? Any life out there? I just see a whole lot of black screens with names and I hope this makes sense. Anybody need me to repeat anything? No? Okay, so let's try, um, let's try a, a more involved example or more difficult if you want to call it that it's a little bit more interesting this is coming from this example is actually coming out of the textbook um so you know let me see uh again we could read a little bit better okay <clears throat> so number 19 again all these things are available in the in the notes section of um on, on the Zoom notes and materials. So this is also an asset retirement obligation. It's a question taken from the textbook. And I'm gonna show you now how to uh, calculate, you know, the present value of this obligation, how the obligation also gets included in the cost of, of the asset along with all the other costs. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll work through this together. So this looks a little bit, you know, crazier than the, than the previous one. So. Jackpot Mining Company operates a copper mine in central Montana. The company paid a million dollars in 2018 for the mining site and spent an additional 600,000 to prepare the mine for extraction of the copper. So if you think back to, um, to our four costs that we include right in the, in the cost of, of natural resources, you've got the acquisition cost, which is the million over here. You've got the 600,000 which is the an exploration cost, right? To prepare the mine. Well, I guess more like hmm, development slash exploration costs, I guess. Yeah, if it's excavation, I would think of it as exploration costs. Um, it might have included some intangible development costs, but those go in um, because they're preparing the mine for extraction, which, you know, I'm like a stuck record now. It's part of the cost, right? To get the asset to the location and condition where it's ready for its intended use. So we already know that there's 1.6 million in costs that are being included. After the copper is extracted in approximately four years. So the, the number of years is important here because when we think about calculating the present value of the asset retirement obligation, we basically, we need a few things we need um, to know what the actual dollar amount of the asset retirement obligation is going to be in the future. We need to know in how many years time we have to pay that money and we have to know what the interest rate is that, um, you know, that is in effect, uh, well, in this question, but also in, in general, if you're doing it, you know, at your company or whatever. So the company is required to restore the land to its original condition including repaving of roads and replacing a green belt. So this is the restoration cost, um, but it doesn't tell us what exactly this costs. It just tells us that in four years they have to do this. Now they start to tell us what the cost is and it gets even a little bit more involved because they are giving percentages and things that look a little bit wild here. The company has provided the following three cash flow possibilities for the restoration cost. Cash outflow probability one is um, 300,000 with a 25% chance of that happening, 400,000 has a 40% chance, and 600,000 has a 35% chance. It's a little bit um, confusing here yeah, because it looks like these you know, numbers in the middle of nowhere, but you can see. So there are three um, 
scenarios. They may pay 300,000, 400,000, or 600,000 with a percentage of probabilities or possibilities attached to that. To aid extraction, Jackpot purchased some new equipment on July the 1st, 2018, for 120,000. So this represents tangible equipment that they purchased. And if we remember from the, um, the theory, Tangible equipment does not form part of uh, the cost of the natural resource. It's a separate asset that would you know, be dealt with on its own and depreciated and so on. So obviously, if you read a question like this, in my mind, I'm saying they're throwing this in as what we would call a red herring or something that's confusing to try and see if you understand that the 120,000 should not go into the cost um, of, of the copper mine. After the copper is removed from this mine, the equipment will be sold. So yeah, that's great, but you know, it's kind of like, so what? Um, the cred credit adjusted risk free rate. And so they just mean like, this is based on the company's, basically like the company's credit rating, like how, you know, you might, if you have a credit rating of 750, you'll get a different interest rate from, you know, a borrower than if you had a credit rating of 550 or whatever. So the company's um, credit adjusted risk-free interest rate is 10%. So this 10% is, is part of what we need to calculate present value. So is the four years. So are, um, so are these three numbers and their probabilities. Um, and it's part of calculating the present value of, of the asset retirement obligation, I mean. So you know, in the first part of the question, in a very cryptic way, they just tell you to determine, right, the cost of, um, of the copper mine. It's, you know, they, they give no guidance on anything else. So then again, you have to remember the four things. It's the acquisition costs, it's the exploration costs, it's development costs, you know, uh, so it's only intangible development costs, and then it's the asset retirement obligation or restoration costs. So we know in this case, we basically have three out of the four. And so we'll see how to get to the cost of the mine and then prepare the journal entries to record the acquisition costs of the mine and the purchase of equipment. So two separate things, if we remember that equipment is part of tangible development costs and won't get lumped into the cost of the mine. Right, so I'll go over here to our trusty little sheet. All right, so we'll start with acquisition costs. And this is, you know, fairly easy to follow. It's a million, it was given in the question, right? And then you've got your development costs. And let me just go back up here and make sure that I'm using proper terminology. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it could also be exploration costs. So I don't know what exactly they're doing when they're um, fixing, you know, the mine to to be to be used. So it could be it could involve exploration as well. All right, so that's the 600,000, 600,000. And then we know that we have the restoration costs. And that's kind of a, a question mark at the moment because <clears throat> we have to figure out how much that actually comes to given that we um, don't, know what the present value of, of the costs is. So the way you're going to do that, remember they said that there were different, uh, I guess, possibilities of, of payments that have to be made. Now, remember the, the restoration cost is an estimate. Um, it's not a fact. We don't really know exactly what we're going to pay at the end. So this company is actually pretty smart. They're, they're saying, you know, all these uh, possibilities add up to 100%. We don't think that it's just 100% likely that we'll pay 400,000. We think that there's different scenarios of what we may have to pay. So we're going to do like a weighted number, right, for our um, 
for our restoration costs, weighted based on the, the probability of, of, you know, which amount, the probability of paying each of these three amounts, let me say it that way instead. So what we have to do is, is weight these amounts according to their percentages to come up with $1 amount, right, as the kind of the sum of, of those probabilities. So you're going to take the 300, so let's, let's call this um, calculating restoration cost, right, so you know what I'm doing. So oh, it's Monday, right? So my uh, typing is is uh, not on point. Um, that fingers yeah today. So three hundred thousand. The probability was twenty five percent. Four hundred thousand. The probability of paying that is forty percent. And six hundred thousand. The probability of paying that is thirty five percent. So I hope you understand that we're not saying that the company is going to pay out all of these dollar amounts over here, right? They're just saying we don't quite know exactly what we will pay eventually. So we're just saying, you know, how likely is it that we'll pay each of these amounts, and in the end, we'll come up to some amount that is kind of like the sorry, the combination of these three probabilities. Um, and so that amount is 445,000, right? So what this then means is they're saying that, you know, looking at all the probabilities, the amount that we will most likely pay is 445,000 because it's, you know, it's, it's what we end up waiting all our stuff to, to get to, all right? So now this 445,000 is, what will or what will likely because it's not a fact be paid in four years four years time so the question is what is 445 paid in four years time worth today in essence what is the present value of 445,000. So you have the amount, right? It's 445,000 for the present value calculation. The number of years is four based on the question and the interest rate is 10%. This is all coming out of the question. Okay, I'm not making anything up. It's all there. There's the 10%, we waited the amount and there's the four years. So now, now the and and this way I wrote the amount. This would also be called sometimes you know you see the book use proper terminology like this future value. So now I'm trying to calculate present value. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what we have to do here is you can either do it straight on a financial calculator, you can do it in Excel and so on. But the way it's I guess taught or expected to be done over here is, did I open this up? No, I did not. Um, just one second. You just find it and I look. Oh yeah. We have to use this delightful table. <laughs> Maybe you guys have seen this already in your 201 or, or wherever 112 or in your finance class. But basically this table shows the present value of $1 at various interest rates, time periods. So it's used to calculate the present value of any single amount. Where can you find this table? If you go to the textbook, just to make sure that um, people know in case you want to do your own digging. Obviously, you can find it online, um, you know, present value of a dollar. It's not going to be hard to find. But near the bitter end <laughs> of the textbook, um, in one of these, where was I? Yeah, in one, of, even after the appendices, there's present value and future value tables. This is... Um, this is where I was. Be careful that you don't use the wrong table. The table one is for future value, right? Which is not, you're asking, when you do future value, you're asking, you know, what is an amount that I have today going to be worth in the future? Whereas I am using uh, table two, you know, which is the present value, all right? And um, like I said before, we have, this is the formula, this, you know, when I was studying, you know, back decades ago, right? Yeah. Uh, when I was studying, this is what we used. Um, 
and we had to kind of manually calculate it, but you don't have to use that. Uh, and in fact, I'll just use the table over here instead of using the one that I pulled out of the textbook. So, so what we're asking is for um, an N, which is the number of years of four years, right? That's what we have in our example. Um, and an interest rate of 10%. So I have to go over a little bit because our percentage is so high. I don't know, you know what the others was when interest rates were 10%. But so it's one, two, three, four, four years, 10% uh, interest. This is going to be the, the amount by which you multiply the future value to get to the present value. All right, that's that's how we figure this out. So again, you're looking at the present value of a dollar for four years. Uh, or, you know, uh, the, a dollar four years is the time period, and ten percent is the interest rate. This present value factor is then what you use in your calculation. So let's call this the present value factor from the table. So again, when you Let's go from table two. So if you're studying or whatever, you can remember what I was doing. It's going to be 0 0.68301. Notice how it's less than one, which makes total sense because not only from the formula perspective, but also because 445,000 in four years time is going to be a lower amount today, right? Because <clears throat> that 445,000 has to from today, whatever the amount is of, of the present value is growing to 445,000. So the present value should be less today than what it was, than the amount that it will be in the future. So you take the 445,000 and you multiply it by the present value factor and you end up with this number. 30393, I'll just round it down, 939, okay? And this represents, represents the fair value or present, present value of the asset retirement obligation which is the same as the restoration cost. Okay, that's what we calculated here. So this is the amount then that we add in to do this. So for quick reference, someone can see that these two numbers belong to each other. So that's what we add into further into the cost of the copper mine. So then the total cost of the copper mine which was the, the first question that we had to answer. Oops, what did I do wrong here? Oh, oops, AJ. All right, 1,903,939. Okay, so that's the, that's the total cost of the mine. Questions there, folks? Um, anything that you wanna clarify? Can this be on a test? Yes, if, <laughs> I don't know if that's like the classic question, but is there anything else that you, that you want me to repeat? All right, great silence is upon us. So that's the cost of the copper mine. Then the, the journal entries for the acquisition cost of the mine and the purchase. Oh, look, someone's decided to speak. Can you explain the present value factor? Um, it's a very broad question. Do you mean, I, and I think you said that your, your sound doesn't work, right? Yeah, no, I know that you're asking for the question we just did. You're asking me about the 0.68. Do you mean the mechanics of where to of how to find it again or why the number? Okay, so yeah. So to take a step back, Jonathan, um, 
I, I think you're okay with uh, the 445,000, right? That we got that by weighting these numbers based on the probability that they will actually happen. That 445,000 is what we will pay. This is what we will pay or we will, well, I already wrote that. This is what we will likely be paid in four years time. But we don't want to record something today that is the value from four years time, we need to know what that is worth today. And so, you know, this is like any investment or something. If you invest money today somewhere, you expect the money to grow, to get more, right? To, to grow to a particular amount. So this is how much the amount has grown to in four years time. We need to know how much money do you have to have today at 10% for four years to get to 445,000, right? So what amount today, if I had to go put it into a bank or whatever, right? For four years and I earn 10% on it would get me to 445,000. And based on the tables, and so I'm gonna go back to the table over here. Based on the tables, I'm saying four years. So it's a little bit awkward to see it here. So I'll just go back down and scroll across. But on the on the left hand side is the number of years. Okay. And on the top is the percentage. So this is the, the column for, for four years. And um sorry, not the column, the row for four years. And this is the column for 10%, which is what we're working with. So I know based on, you know, this, someone has already calculated for us basically the present value factor and said, if you, if you were looking at an amount that is going to be invested today, right, for four years at 10%, Right. This is this is the present value factor for that amount. And so I'm saying, OK, I know basically I know what the answer is. I know, you know, the the factor, but what is the amount today that I will have to put in to a deposit or something to get to four hundred forty five thousand? And the way I did that was over here, I said four forty five thousand times zero point. 68301 and that's going to give me 303939 tells me that today right 445000 in 4 years time is the same as 303939 today i hope i'm answering um the question you can ask okay you got it all right I was going to say you can ask more, me more to expand more. I, I just feel like I'm at the risk of repeating myself now. And so um, let me see if the math works out. Maybe I can show it in the other direction also. It's probably dangerous to do this. Let me just check my math before I do it. Yeah, so just in case someone wants to see how it goes in the other direction, this is the future value table. If I look at 10% for four years, this is the number I'm working with, right? 146410, okay? So all this is saying is, if I had the present value today, and I multiplied it by 146410, which is the future value factor, right? That's coming from table one. Then what ends up happening is I actually get back close, not quite there, but I actually get back to 445,000. So th that's how these tables work. You can either go from a number that you know in the future and figure out what that number is today. Or if you have a number today, you can use the future uh, value factor to figure out what that number will be in the future, All right? So it's, it's a useful, um, these tables are, are useful to go in either direction. For our purposes, we will always want to know the present value of the asset retirement obligation because um, 
we are trying to calculate today what the cost of the natural resource is, okay? So we'll always be looking for present or fair value. Any other questions on this? Okay, so that was first, that was just the first part. This is the answer for number one. I still have to do uh, the journal entries with you for um, the number two part of this question, right? So let me put in debits and credits and we'll read the question again to remind ourselves what they asked for. They said, prepare the journal entries to record the acquisition costs of the mine and the purchase of the equipment. So it might be easier to do the purchase of the equipment first because it basically has nothing to do with the acquisition cost of the mine. It's its own separate thing. Remember, they paid 120000 for the equipment. They don't say that they bought it on account, so we can assume that it was purchased for cash. So we're going to debit equipment for 120000 and credit cash. And remember, I mean, this is, yeah, it's part of the question, but to some extent, perhaps, the question was also just trying to test you here um, to see if you understand that uh, the equipment does not form part of the cost of the mine, right? And so the second piece is the acquisition cost of the mine. So <clears throat> we now have to go into journalizing that amount that we just calculated. So that amount is over here, the 1,903,939. So we will debit the copper mine, right? That's the asset. Debit the copper mine with, so I'll just go and drag this number from up here. So that when you guys are looking at the spreadsheet, you know what happened, 1,903,939, right? And the cash that we pay though, is not the same as that. Because remember, part of the cost of the mine is the asset retirement obligation that will only be paid for in the future. So the actual cash that we're paying out today, today right, is only the, the cost of the mine and all those exploration slash development costs, the 1.6 million, right? Which if you go back, you'll see the 1.6 million is these two numbers. And then the restoration cost is going to be uh, recorded separately, right, as an asset retirement obligation. And like I said, we, we, it's outside the scope of our work to go into this, but this obligation will grow every year uh, for the next four years until it becomes um, $450,000 on the books. And the, you know, the debit side of the obligation is going to be expensed uh, via depletion expense. Questions on the journal entry? I think for the journal entry, just to you know, answer a question that maybe hasn't been asked, but I'll just say it again. Uh, you just want to be careful not to just credit everything to cash and forget that there's a requirement to, to carry the asset retirement obligation as a liability. I think that's probably the one stumbling block that I can see uh, for people going through this. All right, so we learned a lot of uh, new concepts here. This is, you know, pretty pretty involved example compared to the one before. Um, you had this notion of weighting different amounts because of the uh, probability of happening and coming up to a total amount that you would use as, as the basis for your present value calculation. You also had to remember that this amount represented a future value um, in four years time. So you couldn't record it today as 445,000. You had to figure out what is 445,000 in four years time worth today so that I could put the fair value of that on my books. To do that, you needed to know how many in how many years time the amount has to be paid out, which we already know is four. And you also needed to know what is the interest rate that you need to calculate within a 10%. So then you go to table two, uh, you know, in the end of the book or you use a present value calculator on a you know financial I mean a present value function on a financial calculator or you use the present value formula in Excel or however you do it but um, with the with the tables it's just a quick reference and you come out to this present value factor so it's basically saying that 
what it, the amount today, right, based on this number of years and the interest rate, the amount today will be about 68% of the future value, right? That's what it's saying, right? 68%, 68.3% of the future value. So when you multiply the future value by this factor, you come out to 303,000, which is about 68.3% of 445,000, obviously. And so it's the present value that you add on to the cost of the mine. And like I said, that present value is then shown separately in the journal entry as the asset retirement obligation. And that asset retirement obligation will um, accu accumulate over time through some additional calculations and be credited with a particular amount every year to get it from 303,000 to 450,000. So that by the time we have to pay out uh, the, the, sorry, 445,000. So that by the time we have to pay out the 445,000, our financial statements actually reflect the liability at its future value. All right, so that's how it works. Okay, so a lot happening there. Uh, tables that you may or may not have seen in, in, in the past um, also showed you how to get from a present value to a future value. It has to work, you know, both ways. Okay, so. Professor, sorry. Yeah. Can you please I'm so happy to hear someone's voice. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a little confused. Um, how yeah. can we find the uh, travel? Uh, sorry, uh, 120,000 for equipment and the cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's over here in the a question you asked. Your, your question yeah. was too easy for me now, man. I thought you were oh, asking okay. something else. Okay. <laughs> they purchased some new equipment for 120,000. I said that because it doesn't say that they purchased on account or use the notes payable, you have to assume that they paid cash. I understand. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? folks. All right. So this is, again, this is available for you to look at at any time. Um, <clears throat> just going back up here, we'll, we'll take a break here in a second, but I, I just want to talk about what's coming next and then we'll break. So we're done with the AROs. You can see, um, you know, to some extent, this chapter is a little bit dangerous, I guess, because it's so many different topics, even though they're all, you know, all roads lead to like asset acquisition in some way. But um, but the, the nature of the topics is that it's not just like asset acquisition, we bought something and that's the end of it. Um, it's different types of assets and it's different types of acquiring, you know, different ways in which we acquire the asset. In fact, in the example that we just used, we acquired an asset through, you know, the creation of this, we acquired an additional portion of our asset through the creation of this liability assets retirement obligation because we have to restore um, restore the, the asset back to its original condition. When we come back from break, we'll be looking at intangible assets and um, those shouldn't pose too much of a problem because you've kind of run into them before their assets, um, but they, you know, their value is, is not necessarily in a physical substance. Um, it's more to do with the future revenue that's flowing because we have the rights to whatever that intangible asset um, represents. If you think about um, forever, I mean, everybody's not a fan, but it's topical because it was in the news this morning that Adele, uh, the singer broke records, um, you know, this past Friday, she released a song, Easy On Me, and it broke single day streaming records um, on Spotify and other, you know, I think streaming providers, I think about 24 million streams, you know, uh, happened. I don't know if it was a unique, like 24 million people or just, you know, someone listened to it like a million times or something, but I mean, it's a good song in my humble opinion. But the, what's the point of saying that? Um, Adele obviously would have to make sure that she has um, some type of 
copyright, some type of agreement, uh, agreements with Spotify and others so that they're not just taking a song and streaming it and advertising to us and making a lot of money and she's not getting any money. That's an example, right? The copyright, for instance, is an example of an intangible asset. It's not some big mine or some big building that somebody has and it's like really obvious that this is something that's worth, worth uh, you know, some amount. Instead, this is the artist's um, creative work um, and that is attached or should be attached to a stream of revenue. So it's more likely than not that Adele um, and her management would have struck agreements with these streaming services to make sure that she's getting some portion of the revenue from that. And that's an intangible asset at work, right? That's, that's how an intangible asset would, um, would play out in real life. So we'll take a break here, 11.30 to 11.40. Um, I'll stick around if people have questions about anything. When we come back, we will talk about intangible assets. And I also want to talk to you about something that's happening in the Reg Hour on Wednesday. Okay, so hopefully I'll remember that. So 10 minute break. Uh, feel free to chat to me during the break if you have questions about anything. Hi, hello, Professor. Hello. Hi, sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Hi, Professor, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? How are you? I'm great. Um, Professor, can you um, go over with me my paper, term paper? Yeah, but, yeah, um, but um, I, I, don't I don't think it's a good think idea, it's a good to, idea go to go over, over during, during the break, break because... because... Not break, after the break. You mean during my office hours? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, going yeah, to be on the call, on the at, call one. at one. Okay, Professor, thank you. No problem. No problem.
So breaks over um, and we'll get back to our programming. So we have a few things to do in this next, whatever it is, hour and a bit. Um, I'm going to just quickly first talk about something that's happening on Wednesday in the Reg Hour, which is the one o'clock class. Then um, we'll do a little bit more on intangible assets, and then I'll leave space to talk about what's in the, the test and the quiz that's coming up, okay? So the first thing is about... Um, so let me just actually pause. All right. So coming to intangible assets, we kind of spoke a little bit about the, the fact that um, there's some type of ownership that provides benefits uh, to the owner, um, but it's not you know, as obvious as like equipment or a building or a mine or something like that. It's normally more like a contract, something that's written on paper. The paper is not, you know, that valuable. It's it's more um it's more about what the agreement gives you access to. Most of the time it's got something to do with future revenue streams. Um, and you know, you can either if it's a patent, you can use it to produce goods or services and, and so on. Um, you may purchase the intangible or you could develop uh, the intangible asset internally, right? So um, I'll give you an example of a purchased int intangible um, and it will come up a bit later as well. And this is like the classic one that's purchased, but over here, um, I think we all kind of know that Facebook owns WhatsApp. And I believe it was somewhere in the 2014 um, timeframe, which, you know, is, is long ago now, seven years ago, uh, Facebook bought WhatsApp for almost 20 billion. That's billion with a B. Um, and at the time, I mean, WhatsApp didn't really have much going for it by way of assets. In fact, the assets minus the liabilities of WhatsApp the, the, you know, the identifiable assets minus liabilities, things that you could either touch or that you could see, you know, on a piece of paper, this is what they own, this is what they owe. Those things were like just somewhere between three and four billion. So, I mean, if, if Facebook had bought WhatsApp for book value, they would pay somewhere in the arena of three to four billion, but instead they paid 20 billion, right? So now the question becomes, where does the difference, you know, what is that difference? Why are they paying so much money extra for this company? And, you know, in the end, they, sorry, this extra 15 billion that they paid is what we call goodwill. Um, we'll talk more about it, but Goodwill is basically the extra that a company pays when they buy another company um, that isn't necessarily attached to some type of asset in the sense that, oh yeah, we're paying extra because of that building or we're paying extra because of your customers. They're really just paying extra because by virtue of owning the business, they believe that there's some type of future revenue stream or future benefit that is going to come to them. And I mean, Facebook says this, right? We believe the amount of Goodwill resulting from the allocation of purchase Purchase consideration is attributable to expected synergies from future growth and also from monetization opportunities. So they're saying owning WhatsApp gives us the ability to potentially uh, make money from all the users of WhatsApp that we will have an advantage because it's a, a you know it's a messaging service, so it can help us. Um, and and you may have noticed. I mean, this is long ago, but still, I, I remember that after Facebook bought WhatsApp, there was a distinct improvement in Facebook Messenger functionality. So I'm sure they used some of the they used some of the technology that WhatsApp had to be able to make um, uh, Facebook Messenger better. And you know, they're I, they're still trying to monetize WhatsApp, but does not really, um, in my opinion, really. Uh, generated, like it's not like we're paying for WhatsApp, it's not like we're being advertised to, but maybe there's something more sinister happening in the background, who knows. But the point is, you know, and we'll come back to Goodwill, the point is you can purchase a, an intangible asset, in this case, you know, Facebook bought um, WhatsApp and, and in so doing, basically created an intangible asset, Goodwill, or you could purchase a patent from someone, um, you know, patents the, which give you the right to use something or manufacture something or, or a product or process and it's for 20 years. This is a very big deal with like um, pharmaceutical companies who invent, um, you know, um, 
medications of some sort and they basically corner the market with this med with those medications and they've got all this time right to to be able to to kind of milk the cow for all the money and then when the generic i'm sure you guys have heard this word the generic comes around the generic um medication then it kind of cuts into their profits so sometimes what the companies will do is if they have a patent on a medication they'll you know use the patent and be able to be the exclusive uh, producer of this medication and then just before the patent runs out they will make some tweak to the formula so that they can then have a new patent and just keep going right you also find that patents are often what um, a lot of companies are in uh, law lawsuits about um, and we'll talk later about legal. In fact, you can see it here, legal and filing fees. So sometimes you have to even go and fight about a patent in, um, in court. And so, you know, that's all part of, of the intangible asset. So again, there's developing the asset or purchasing it. Um, purchase intangibles are, are valued at the original cost, whatever you paid for it, right? Uh, to bring it to its location and condition for intended use, we know all about that. Um, and then any legal fees to do that and any filing fees, uh, normally you go, let me see, I think I, I put something here. Yeah, you go to the patent office, um, you first have to search up and make sure that you know whatever you're trying to patent doesn't already have a patent against it and then you go to the patent office to file um file for a patent for whatever it is that you've created and then you know these intangible assets are, are generally amortized this is like depreciation but for intangible assets it's called amortization they're amortized over its useful life unless it has an indefinite useful life so an intangible with an indefinite useful life is something like the goodwill that um that facebook purchased or i guess it was generated by the purchase of whatsapp um, and we'll see that as that intangible assets with indefinite useful lives will go through something that we call an impairment test to see if it's still worth what we thought it was when we first purchased it. Okay. So again, when you purchase an intangible, you you put it in your books at the original cost, and to that you can add any legal and filing fees because it's all part of the cost of getting the asset to the condition and the location for its intended use. Patents can be amortized or are amortized over 20 years, um, or it's either the useful life or the legal life. So a patent may have a useful life that is less than 20 years. 20 years is the legal life. So you go with whatever is shorter, okay? Um, also, if you do go through costs, like again, attorney's fees, is always the attorneys, right? Laughing all the way to the bank. So attorney's fees or other costs related to, um, you know, the, the defending of a patent, to protect the patent, you can uh, put uh, those costs, right? as part of the patent cost, but it has to be a successful, obviously, legal suit. I mean, if you go to court and you find and you lose and it said that the patent isn't yours or, or that you've infringed on someone's patent, I mean, then that patent that you recorded has no worth. So it doesn't make sense to add the cost of the legal fees onto the cost of the patent because the patent should basically be written off your books. So. Again, you capitalize the costs of the patent plus any attorney fees for successful defense of that patent. Um, research and development costs are always uh, expensed. Um, and this comes around later in the chapter. Again, there are some minor, minor exceptions in US GAAP around software costs and a few other things. But for the most part, research and development costs are expensed. So that's a that's a massive um that's a massive for some companies a massive amount of money that goes in as an expense and not as an asset. Why do you guys think let me get some audience participation or not <laughs> based on how quiet you guys are today. Um, why do you think like if you think about it, if you're Google and you're busy or you're Amazon or whatever you're developing for AWS or Google is is developing, you know, some newfangled um, technology, why would the FAS be, right? Why would the accounting standards codification require the research and development costs to be expensed? For your Tesla, 
you know, developing a spaceship or developing electric cars, why, why, why expense that and not capitalize it? The research and development specifically. I'm sorry, what do you actually mean by that? <laughs> capitalize. Like a, when you say capitalize, uh, you mean this is what we spoke about last time, you make something an asset. So capitalize means make it an asset or the alternative is to expense it, right? So what the FASB is saying is that research and development costs are going to have to be expensed. Why do you think that they would force companies to expense them instead of making them an asset? That's the question. I'm not sure, but I feel like to find out people that they don't like more than they really have right now. Doesn't make sense, I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't quite hear what you said. Um, I know you said I'm not like sure. the product they're making right now. They will mm -hmm. want to make more uh -huh. to see if the people like this product or that product. Like ah, yes, more yes, sales. yes, yes. I follow your thread now, and and you're on the right track, um, all. So what he's saying is, you know, if if the company is busy with research and development, there isn't really you don't necessarily know whether the product that you're busy researching and developing now will turn out to be what you're actually going to make in the end because it depends on how successful the process is. I think that's what you were trying to say, Emily. Well, I'm not putting words in your mouth, um, and and that's true, right? Uh, what the what the FASB is saying with research and development is that it's very difficult to determine. You remember and ask. So it's right, a resource that is owned or controlled by the company from which future benefits are expected to flow. That's the definition. So if you get these types of questions, um, you know, in life or on tests, sometimes you just have to go back to basic definitions, right? Why is something an asset or why is it an expense? An asset in, in, implies that there is a future benefit right of this item so if you're um if you're saying that there's a future benefit with research and development costs you just don't know because you're basically in a way experimenting to see whether something is going to work and so it's very difficult to determine what part of the you know amount of money that is being spent is actually translating into the asset that is giving the future benefits so in the end what the FASB you know decided they just said just expense it all because um trying to figure out um where to draw the line of when you should stop expensing and when you can capitalize, meaning make it an asset, is, is I guess, difficult or impossible or whatever. So what's interesting, though, is that international accounting standards do allow some of these uh, research and development costs to be capitalized, and they have, um, they have a Basically, uh, they've drawn a line and said when it's when you can capitalize them is when they become technologically feasible. So, so, so there's diversity in practice, right? In the U.S., we say expense all the R and D, and I mean you can go into a Google Financial or a Tesla Financial, and you see a lot of research and development expense. It's too bad, can't capitalize it. If there had been, um, you know, international. Uh, by international, I mean, if they had done their financials under international accounting standards, they would have looked quite different. Okay, so remember that, um, not just for, you know, a multiple choice question or something, but just in general, when you're out there working these days, a lot of, um, a lot of the work is, is around intangible assets, because that's really, I mean, we're predominantly in service industries and tech and, and so on. That's where a lot of the, the work is for everybody. So, so these things are becoming more and more important to know. And then the last thing, yeah, if a company purchases a patent from an inventor, the purchase price represents its cost, which makes sense, right? When you're buying something, obviously, whatever you're paying for it, unless there's some type of 
you know, weird transaction, um, that's going to be the cost. So sometimes people invent stuff, but they don't actually, they'll go file a patent, but they don't actually want to produce the thing, right? They're just inventors. So then a company will buy um, the patent from them in order to produce that item. There was something like this with, you know, when USB flash drives were, were still a big thing, there was a, a man who invented them um, and he didn't actually produce them. He just, uh, he just, that the, the company wanted to buy a company, I, I can't remember which company wanted to buy the patent from him. And he said, no, he's keeping the patent. They can produce the USBs, but they have to give him a cut of, of, of each one that is produced, which I actually think is brilliant. That's it's because you don't know what the potential is of how many could be produced. And so you, you're getting a constant stream of income. So that's patents, copyrights. This is where we were talking about Adele, um, you know, who's an artist. The, it's musical works, pictures, photographs, and videos, and so on. And it's granted for the life of the creator plus 70 years. Um, useful life is usually less than the legal life, right? So, um, you know, if you, you try to read some books and, you know, it's like Jane Austen or whatever, that person's long dead and gone, 70 years have passed, you can basically do whatever you want with, with that book. If you um, are looking for a book that's like a, a latest release, um, you know, you're supposed to be paying for it. If you, if you don't, that's a copyright infringement because uh, the artist is supposed to get some portion of, you know, of the selling price, depending on what arrangement they made with the publisher. And when it comes to music, it does get a little bit crazy sometimes with the, um, with the studio. Some of them try to make the artists work their property as opposed to, to the masters of all the artists' records. Um, some of the artists don't actually own their own music because the studio writes the contracts in such a way that it doesn't belong to them, um, to the artists outright that belongs to the studio. So, um, you know, that can cause a little bit of a complication for the artists because then the studio can basically do whatever they want with the music. So you find a lot of um, a lot of artists. And I think uh, not that I have listened or listened to much of uh, music, but I did remember reading an article where Taylor Swift was in a big battle with her old studio about trying to get her masters back because they basically owned it and she didn't have control over the use of her own music. Um, and then another thing that happened, and I, and I mean, I'm just throwing this in so you guys don't fall asleep or maybe you're already asleep, right? Another thing is if you know Russell Wilson from the Seattle Seahawks football um, uh, uh, team, he is married to a, a, a musician. I think that you pronounce him Ciara. I might be wrong with the pronunciation. And so he bought her masters for her when they got married so that she would have control over music and would not, um, you know, have to fight with the studios over it. You can see that copyright, uh, you know, over music and, and pictures. That's why if you take a picture off the internet, you don't just put the picture up on your e-portfolio and say, oh yeah, you know, this is a great picture. You have to put a reference, a credit to whoever took the picture or you see on Instagram a lot um, people will put photo credit is whomever because this is all people's works of art that you know for, we can't just be acting like it belongs to us so this is what I was talking about with Adele um, this one day streaming record she beat I guess BTS's butter um, the number dropped a little bit <laughs> they took out like uh, multiple plays by super fans so it's 19.75 million streams so then you know the question is how in a 24 hour time frame so then the question becomes how um, will she get paid what do you guys think how do you think Spotify is going to have to pay her for all the streams that have occurred what do you guys think Or is it, it's, it's like it's Spotify's platform, so it's just too bad at all. You'll make money other ways when you go on tour or whatever. You think she should get paid something? I think they sign up for something, make a deal before they mm -hmm. post. Yep. So they have their backup if something happened to them. Yeah, so thanks, Emdadol. You're where 
together today, <laughs> me and you. Um, how do you, I mean, as, as a simple search, how do artists earn money? They definitely um, do get paid. They get paid on a monthly basis. Um, and then, you know, there's, it's based on like all kinds of models, like revenue from ads and uh, how many streams and whatever, whatever, you know, all these things factor into some formula of, of what the artist ends up getting paid from, uh, from a streaming service. But yes, it's royalties. That's a, a type of um, intangible, as, you know, it's, or from your copyright comes this, a stream of revenue called royalties. And they have to be paid that. You get paid that also for when people play your music on the radio um, and so on, right? So all you need to do, guys, if you, if you don't want to be, you know, counting forever, you just need to come up with like one song that gets played forever on the radio, like Mariah Carey, All I Want For Christmas Is You. I don't think she even needed to like write another song <laughs> after that. And you'll just have like a stream of income you know, forever. Um, so that's a copyright. So, you know, Adele, Mariah. Every Christmas. Is yeah, going every to Christmas song. it becomes number one on, on Spotify. <laughs> and it's like a bajillion streams and she's just laughing all the way to the back, right? So you just come up with your, uh, you know, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Eid, whatever, the song that is going to go with that holiday and, you know, try to get it onto the various platforms and hopefully you can also be, you know, as wealthy as the rest of these people. Um, so that's a, that's a copyright and you can clearly see that nowhere is this like manifested as some big asset thing that you can just see and touch and smell and, and so on. It's, it's just like Emdador was saying, they sign something and then you get royalties based on based on the number of streams, okay? Um, questions up to you, or are we good so far? I'm just gonna run through, run through the rest of them if you don't have questions. All right, so then we come to trademarks and, and trade names. That's, you know, your Nike symbols, your golden arches, um, you know, some emblem that is, is distinctly related to that company or the product or the service. Um, again, if you look at the patent office, right, at their website, you can see you not only can you search for patents, you can also search for trademarks. So I can't come along and try to make my Andrea Francis trademark and it basically looks like the Nike swoosh because I will be, you know, sued and because that trademark is already at the patent office and cannot be replicated. So this comes in a lot with counterfeit goods. Um, um, you know, your fake Chanel bags and your fake Chloe bags and your fake Jimmy shoes or I guess it's Louboutins or whatever people are wearing, uh, fake Yeezys. Um, this is all got to do with the, you know, the fact that what you, what they're putting on the shoe, they're using a trademark to try and make it look like something that it isn't. And, um, you know, it's, it's obviously taking money away from, from the original creators of the stuff. And it's also bamboozling the public who thinks that they're buying one thing, but they're buying another. Um, you can renew a trademark or a trade name indefinitely, which means it's an indefinite life intangible. It will just go on forever. Um, and so there's no amortization, but of course you will look to see if over time it would still worth what you think it is, right? So again, the, the, the money is coming from, you know, the fact that it's this recognizable thing and people are willing to pay some premium amount of money for it. Um, that's, that's what the trademark and trade name give you in terms of the future benefits of the asset. And then we've got franchises. Um, a franchise is a contract. If you've ever walked into a McDonald's or a Dunkin' Donuts or, or something like that, um, you know, you, you're going into a franchise. So someone, uh, maybe some of you even own one or your family owns one, right? You, the headquarters of Dunkin' or, or McDonald's will basically, they're basically allowing you to use their name, all the, the products and things and etc. And you have to pay a fee. I think I looked it up here. It's, the initial fee is 45,000, but then after that, there's all kinds of other, you know, ways that you have to share profits and stuff with them. So it, it can get, uh, you know, it can obviously get expensive, but, you know, 
depending on, on what your goals are, um, you can start this franchise, you would be signing a franchise agreement, which is, you know, part of the intangible asset. And, you know, there's also legal costs and stuff, but there's future benefits because you're selling whatever you're selling um, as part of, of this franchise, okay? So when you think about franchises, you think about um, a McDonald's or a Duncan or something where you know that it's an individual own, well, maybe not an individual, but I mean, it's someone else who's owning it. It's not McDonald's headquarters that's running it and they're trying to make money for themselves and they pay this initial fee to start and then they have to give some, you know, split of the revenue or something um, every month back to, to the company because they have the right to use uh, their name, okay? And then um, the, the last one here is, is the goodwill that I kind of discussed already as part of the WhatsApp um, purchase, but goodwill is an important uh, topic. It's also going to come up again uh, big time um, in, the, in the next chapter, so we want to make sure that we at least understand what it is. Um, goodwill is only recorded when an entire business is purchased because goodwill is a going concern valuation and cannot be separated from the business as a whole. So if you think about goodwill, it's like um, reputation, you know, it's going to be like future revenue because of this company and its name and the technology that it has and so on. It's things that you, you factor, that companies factor into the purchase price, but it's not necessarily represented by a specific asset that you can point you just know that if Facebook goes in and buys WhatsApp, they can't just pay for the identifiable assets. They have to pay for the many years worth of benefits that they're going to get. So if you have a business, um, you know, and someone says, you all want to buy your business and it's, you know, Pura Sherpa LLC and Pura, you've already made a, a name for yourself um, because you do, do such good accounting and you've built up all this customer base and all of that. You're not just going to say to the person, oh yeah, well, on my books, it says that my assets are, you know, $5 million and my liabilities are $2 million. So if you pay me $3 million, then you can have the business. No way. You're going to say, okay, the book, says that it's three million dollars but then i have to think about all the years worth of of revenue that this person will get by virtue of using my name using you know my customers using all these things that um you know that i have uh, built up over time so i have to charge something more than three million dollars and that extra piece maybe Pura decides that you should charge that you're going to ask for one million extra so instead of three million that you're going to sell the business for four million that one million extra is goodwill right to the company that's that's buying the that's buying uh, you out they're paying goodwill <laughs> okay for i'm glad you're now a millionaire as a result of this example so um so it it doesn't goodwill doesn't happen um <laughs> goodwill doesn't happen just you know when people are getting together to do business just like a patent or a franchise, Goodwill is only in the context of purchasing a whole business. So when Amazon bought Whole Foods, there was Goodwill because Amazon knew the name Whole Foods is a big deal, you know, especially in, in certain areas and, and they wanted to make sure that they, you know, were, well, Whole Foods, obviously the owners and stuff want to make sure that they get a premium because once you sell, that's it for you as the owner. You can't come back and say to Amazon, oh, I see you're making a whole lot of profits now after the fact, give me more money, right? Sometimes they structure the contracts, you know, that way, but for the most part, you want to try and bake in all those future benefits right at the beginning. So, Internally generated goodwill is not recorded. This is an important point. So, you know, that sounds almost now like a contradiction, but it's not. What, what we mean by that is when Facebook buys WhatsApp, right? Facebook can record the goodwill related to, um, to buying WhatsApp, but Facebook cannot record goodwill that it feels it created just by being Facebook. It can't say, you know, we have a billion users across the world. So as a result, we should have goodwill on our books coming from how brilliant, you know, we are. That's not a thing, okay? Um, you cannot, so internally generated goodwill is not going to be recorded. It's only goodwill when you actually buy another company. And part of the reason that internally generated goodwill cannot be recorded is that it's very subjective. I mean, if I have to walk, 
around and ask, um, you know, I'm gonna ask Marina, hey Marina, what do you think your reputation is worth, right? Marina's gonna first of all, look at me like I've got two heads and then she's gonna say, I don't know, you know, because it's difficult to put a price on it, right? What is your reputation worth? I don't know, you know, it, we would have to go through a lot of discussion and, and basically almost, uh, you know, a, a, a lengthy process to even begin to figure that out. So so when, when we talk about internally generated goodwill, you could almost think of it as like the company wants to put some value on its own reputation and ability. And it's very difficult to figure out what that amount would be. So we're just going to say, no way can you record it. The FASB says you can't, but purchase goodwill is the excess of the purchase price of an acquired business over the fair value of the identifiable net assets required. What a mouthful, right? What a mouthful. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll show you an example in a minute, um, but it, it just, just to, to finish up here, goodwill is a residual amount. So it's the extra that's left behind. Um, and you have to calculate the goodwill in the context of what someone is actually paying uh, for the company. So to make it a little bit easier to, to see how this works, I'm just going to go to an example of 14 in our work and show you what we mean by the excess of the purchase price over the fair value of the net assets acquired, okay? Because that is an important definition. So, you know, it's a mouthful, but it also, we also need to understand it. So I'm going to example 14. I'll read it with you in a minute. I just want to set myself up here. And once we, We'll see how far we get with this because I still want to leave some time to go over the test stuff, okay? Um, here we go. Example 14. This is a, the Goodwill example. On September the 1st, 2012, Winans Corporation acquired. So there you see, right? It's remember we said Goodwill is only going to be in the con is only going to be recorded in the context of a business acquisition bought. Acquired means bought, right? Acquired Omont Enterprises for a cash payment of 700000 So that's the purchase price. 700,000 is a purchase price. At the time of purchase, Oman's balance sheet showed assets of 620,000. So that's his, the historical cost of the assets, 620,000. Liabilities of 200,000, also historical cost, and owner's equity of 400,000. And sorry, 420,000. That makes sense because assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity, right? That's from back in the day. So 620,000 equals 200,000 plus 420. So the balance sheet was balancing, good news. The fair value of Oman's assets is estimated to be 800, Thousand. So when we purchase a company, we can, we'll see the financials and the financials will give us some information. But remember, in the financials, everything is based on historical costs. But when you're buying the company, you're not necessarily going to be basing your price. In fact, the company would probably be upset if you base the price that you are offering them on historical costs, because they could say, hey, we, you know, this is a building that we bought years ago and the, and the fair value is much higher than the cost. So you need to look at fair value not cost. So you can see over here for the assets, the, the historical cost or the book value, right? Uh, cost minus accumulated depreciation is 620,000, but the fair value is higher, 800,000. So there's a 180,000 difference. So let me help you to understand this, compute the amount of goodwill acquired by Winans. So let's start with part A. So how do we define goodwill, right? That's what we need to go back to. Goodwill is the excess. Notice how the, the theory behind the stuff is going to help you to answer the question. It's the extra of whatever you paid minus the fair value of what you are getting. That's how you, you know, that's how you kind of clarify that in your mind. The extra, extra of what you paid over the fair value of what you are getting. So, all right, the dear goodwill is the excess of the purchase price over the fair value of the net 
identifiable assets, okay? And net assets equals assets minus liabilities. Identifiable assets equal the assets on the company's balance sheet plus any other assets that can be, um, I guess, identified is, is the word identified at the time of purchase, okay? So um, I guess I should say assets. Yeah, it's fine. And liabilities, we know what liabilities are. Liabilities are obviously equals the right the obligations on the company's financial statements. I mean that's that's and the reason why they probably won't be liabilities that haven't been recorded yet is that, that, you know for liability to exist is a it's a present obligation as a result of a past event so it already happened. Sometimes with assets, there are certain assets that are not recorded. Um, like the example here would be example um, internally generated assets that haven't been being reported by the company, okay? So it's possible with assets that you may find extra things that haven't been recorded, but um, liabilities, they're either there or they're not there. So this is the formula, right? Goodwill is the excess, the extra of the purchase price over the fair value of the net identifiable assets. So calculating goodwill, you're gonna start with the purchase price, and it's, and it's basically always like this, right? The purchase price, what is the purchase price? Going back to uh, the question, we said it was 700,000. That's the cash payment, okay? So we paid 700,000 to buy this company. Now you want to say, what is the fair value of the assets? And what is the fair value of the liar? Liabilities because assets minus liabilities. So then the question is, what is the fair value of the net assets? Okay, so fair value of the assets going back, we've got 800,000. Okay, that's the fair value of the assets. Fair value of the liabilities going back to the question. It just says liabilities are 200,000. So what we learn in these questions is when they're silent about the fair value of the liabilities, it means that the book value and the fair value are the same, which is often the case with liabilities. It's rare that you find that a liability, you know, at whatever it's being carried is, is suddenly completely different from what you actually have to pay off in the end, unless there's some contractual agreement. So we assume that when the question is silent on fair value of liabilities, that it's also the same or that it's the same as book value. So the fair value of the liabilities is um, same as book value, okay, 200,000. So then this then asks us what is the fair value of the net assets, right? Remember, it's the net, let's even put this identifiable because goodwill is not identifiable. That's why they say that way for the goodwill that we're purchasing. Excess of the purchase price, there's the purchase price over the fair value of the net identifiable assets. So you're saying 800,000 minus 200,000. So the fair value of the net identifiable assets is 600,000. So that's the number that we pull across over here. And so our goodwill is the excess. How much extra did we pay? And it's obvious, right, that it's 100,000. So that's how you calculate goodwill. 700,000 minus the fair value of the net identifiable assets is 100,000. So that's goodwill. So if you understand what the, um, what the formula is, well, it's not even formula, it's just the, the sentence is, is asking you to do, then it becomes a little bit easier to do this. Uh, you know, you guys will run into business combinations in a big way at your four-year schools and so on. And I just encourage you to make sure you understand how this uh, this 
you know, uh, calculation works because when there's an acquisition, there's always going to be some types of assets and liabilities. You're looking for the fair value, not the book value, unless it's the same, right? And then you're looking for the fair value, not of all the assets, because if we just took 800,000, we'd say that we had negative goodwill, which isn't the case. You're looking for assets minus liabilities. Remember, net assets equals assets minus liabilities. So it's the 600,000, which then gives us goodwill of 100,000. Questions on that? Okay, so that was the part uh, A, and then in B, it's asking you to do the journal entry to record, um, right? To record the journal entry winings makes for the acquisition. Again, acquisition just means you bought the company. So when I buy the company, all the assets of that company become my assets. So I have to record all their assets. All the liabilities become my liabilities. So I also have to record those. I need to recognize the 100,000 of goodwill that I paid. And I also have to recognize the 700,000 of cash that I no longer have, right? So because I paid it for, um, for the company, I'm oh, sorry, this is, should be part B. Okay. So here we go with the acquisition journal entry, right? That's the name of it. I'm just trying to make sure that it's a lot of uh, vocabulary and things, make sure that people know what's happening, right? So the acquisition journal entry, we bought assets, we record them. Sorry, this is too far away. Um, we bought assets. We record them at fair value. Everything is fair value, okay? Not book value. It's just that the liability, fair value, and book value is the same. We bought the assets. They're 800,000 debit. The goodwill is also an asset that we will record at 100,000 debit, okay? It's an intangible asset, obviously. Then we paid cash. So that's a credit to cash because we're lower on the cash front, 700,000. So we're missing 200,000 because we, you know, we have 900,000 on the debit, only 700,000 on the credit. So the 200,000 is obviously the liabilities. So we have to assume the liabilities of the company. So we credit liabilities for 200,000. So that's how the um, adjusting, um, adjusting, sorry acquisition journal entry looks, right? You, you take on all the assets of the company at fair value. So you record that as a debit. You don't forget to record the goodwill that you just calculated. You record the payment of cash that you made that comes from the question. And you also record the liabilities at fair value. In this case, the liabilities at fair value are the same amount as book value. So that concludes the Goodwill um, example. Does anybody have questions about the journal entry? All right, so I'll stop it here and go to um, back, you know, in the last few minutes that we have, I promised that I would go over everything that is outstanding and go over the test and quiz information. So, um, Again, today, your chapter nine homework is due at 6 p.m. Guys, there's no extensions and stuff. I, the, these dates are worth carefully thought out so that you have enough time to do everything and also enough time after the work is due to st start studying and or, or be studying um, and still finish the test within the window that's um, provided. There's a test and a quiz that will open up tomorrow morning at nine o'clock uh, Eastern time, nine o'clock in, um, in Connect. So tomorrow's the 19th. You don't have to start tomorrow. You can still study and decide when you want to do it. Maybe you want to do it on the weekend or whatever. All I'm saying is that um, by the 26th, Tuesday the 26th at 6 p.m., that's when it closes. So if you wait until Tuesday the 26th at 4 p.m. to start and the clock hits 6 p.m., your work will auto submit whatever you've done at that point and, and you're done, okay? So don't wait till the last minute. Um, word of warning, and I'll probably keep saying this, 
once you start the quiz or the test, you have to finish it within the time allocated. You can't, you know, come and go. There's no pause button. Even if you shut down your computer, even if you, you know, throw your computer away because you got so mad at me or your internet stopped working or whatever, um, you want to make sure that you are ready with a charged computer with a proper internet connection um, with you know the quiet or whatever you need to be able to um to do the the test remember for those who are, are maybe already going onto campus because you are going to have in-person classes the library is open if you really feel like you need quiet time to um to do something they should also have good uh internet otherwise just think of a time in your home life where you would be less likely to be disturbed so that you can focus on on doing this you know in a in a way that that will be useful to you and won't have you scrambling you know trying to finish stuff because people are constantly interrupting you i understand that interruptions are almost like the theme of covid right because everybody's or people are still working from home there's kids there's all kinds of stuff going on i get it um so I'm just asking you to think carefully about when would be a good time to do this. Um, Pura, go ahead. Yes. So um, the test is open until uh, October 26. But if we open the test, is there a time limit? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that there is. So I'll tell you the times that I gave you guys. The test itself, you have three and a half hours, 3.5 hours. Um, mm -hmm. It's more time than you need, but I know that people have some difficulty sometimes with uh, navigating, you know, on this uh, online testing. So I'm um, normally it would be two hours that I give you guys, but um, I'm giving you one and a half hours extra just in case you, you know, the the navigation and and stuff and 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 so on is just causing a problem. So one three and a half hours. For the test and the quiz, I really gave you extra time. You should do the quiz before you do the test. I gave you two hours for the quiz, not because the quiz is written for two hours. Some people probably finish it in 30 minutes, but because there are some calculations, I do want you guys to take your time and think about things and, and really try, as opposed to just seeing a clock ticking and freaking out and just choosing any answer, okay? So let's say you decide tomorrow you're gonna start doing the quiz. From If you decide tomorrow at 11 o'clock, you're gonna start the quiz. If you click start at 11, you have to be done by 1 p.m. because that's when the time will be finished. And I, I know that most people will be done before then, but I'm building in some extra time just to make sure that you're okay with the system, that you, you know, no one's, no one's having a panic mode because of, of a time crunch um, for the quiz. And then the test, again, you have uh, more, you have ample time, three and a half hours. And I'll, um, I'll tell you now what is on there. For the, for the quiz, um, first of all, let's just go over this step by step because I feel like I'm jumping all over the place. So we know when this stuff is opening. But Pura, I answered your question, right? That you actually have a time limit. You you don't have the whole yes. week to do it. Yeah, you you, have, yes. you can choose any day within the week to do it. You can do it in the middle of the night if you want to, but you you don't have a whole week. You can't come and go. You have to, Once you decide this is the time when you're starting, you have to finish it within the time allocated. The test is 15%, one five of your grade, and and the quiz is 3% of your grade. This goes back to, you know, you guys know this already because it's in the grade weighting stuff um, from before. So, you know, you're, you should have been aware and you probably are aware. This is everything that, um, how you graded in the class, the e-portfolio, the term research paper, the tests and so on. Um, and then the quiz, it's going to be two quizzes in this class, 3% each, right? Um, there's no deadline extensions or makeup tests unless you're telling me, yes, the doctor's note, yes, the, you know, immigration thing or yes or whatever. There's not like, oh, I got super busy and, and so, you know, I forgot or, oh, I got super busy and I'm running out of time. You have a whole week's window. That's why I make it a week so that you can decide when you want to do it. But please don't contact me, you know, on the 26th to say that you need extra time. It won't be able to um, be given to you unless something happened, um, 
you know, that is really throwing you off and then I would need proper documentation. This is part of, of me being fair to the whole class that people can't just get extra time because they didn't plan properly, but also uh, the work just keeps piling on itself, you know, so you getting ex extensions means that you're running late for the next round of homework and so on. Um, this is what I said, even though we have a week's window, both of these assignments are timed. So once you start them, you have to complete the work in one sitting. There's no pause button and the clock will keep ticking. If you close the browser or shut down your computer, please find a time where you know you will have enough time, proper bandwidth and be able to concentrate to complete this work. Do, please do the quiz before attempting the test. And the reason I'm saying that is that the quiz is lower stakes. It's 10 multiple choice questions on chapters eight and nine. Remember this test is on chapter eight and nine. It's focusing, it's not definitions. I think that's how you guys usually call it, theory, right? Definitions. I'm asking you to do calculations. I'm asking you to do journal entries, ledger accounts, and so on. And it's on topics that are coming up in the test. And usually the quiz can give you some idea of whether you actually know the material or you need to go back and, and study more. So it's, it's, it's better to to struggle a little bit on something that counts 3% and get an idea of where you are at than to go straight into the test and then find out that you're having problems and you could have figured that out you know, in the quiz already. Um, the test is, is also gonna have multiple choice questions. It has about 10 multiple choice questions. There are definitions in there or theory. It's not really definitions like what is FIFO, but there's theory questions, you know, um, <clears throat> in there like words as opposed to calculation. So it's a combination of words and calculations. I do expect you to know some of the theory around like if like how we had in in um in the change, let's say change of uh, let's say inventory errors, you know, if if ending inventory is overstated, what happens to cost of goods sold or or change in accounting method, you know, is it retrospective or how do we do the change in the method? That's what I mean by theory, where you don't necessarily just have to calculate the number, you also have to understand, you know, the, the thinking behind it. And some of those questions, the answers are just words, they are not numbers. Um, and so like, you know, you might ask, you know, why do companies like to use LIFO because they want to save taxes or something like that. So you do need to know uh, the theory around the work in addition to calculations for the test. In the quiz, I'm asking you, I only have 10 questions to work with. So I'm asking you more calculations and stuff so that you can be sure that you are hitting this, you know, information. I think the multiple choice questions ended up being, um, let me just think carefully now, 12 points on the test and the rest is all calculations, all right? So please be aware that um, this is not a straight multiple choice test where, you know, 100% of the points you'll just be able to guess and answer. They are exercises, okay, covering um, these topics. There's FIFO, LIFO, average cost. There is a dollar value LIFO um, question. There's a lower of, of cost or market uh, calculation plus the journal entry. I, I finalized the test last night, so I know what's on there, right? It's, it's there. There's a gross profit method uh, uh, question and there's a retail inventory method question. What I'll tell you is that at least two, maybe three of the questions that I had to choose in the end because there's so little variety in, in what I can choose uh, for the, um, <laughs> for the for the test are basically the same as, as homework questions that you've had already. I repeat, I think three, two or three of the questions in the exercises are basically the same as homework questions that you had, like that you're busy doing now for chapter nine and that you had for chapter eight. So please, if you haven't done the homework, you still have what they call study attempts in Connect, which basically means that you can go into the homework and, and use the questions to study, to see you know, what the answers are, and also get used to filling out the answers in those little blocks and things um, that Connect asks you to do. Uh, two, if you have done the questions and you got them all right, remember I went over the questions with you and, and so on. If you have done the questions, please review them again, because like I said, the, the test questions are basically very similar, if not the same. Obviously, the amounts are different, but it's going to be similar to the homework. The homework for chapter nine is due today, but on, on Wednesday, um, 
I will go over the whole homework with you again. So if you're not feeling comfortable with something in the homework, don't start the test tomorrow. Um, you know, wait until Wednesday for me to, the first thing we'll do together on Wednesday is go over the chapter nine homework, wait to ask your questions or whatever, or email me if you have questions already. Um, but I will go over the chapter nine uh, homework with you uh, this coming, right, this, this coming class, um, yeah, on, on Wednesday. And then you'll still have, you know, six days after that to do the quiz and the test. So, so you know, if you're feeling super confident, you got everything right. Sorry, this is not where I meant to go. You got everything right. You know what's going on, you know, and you just want to get the test and the quiz over and done with, then please go ahead. But don't be like I've had this happen before. And it's, it's just not a possibility where people have just decided to like try the quiz and the test and then they don't do as well as they hoped and then they ask me if they can do it over and the answer is no <laughs> you can't like take a test and then say that you want to do it over now let's talk about attempts um for for the for the test you have th up to three attempts to answer the question okay so it's not like it's a one and done situation you can uh you know you 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 can do more than one attempt so and i'll put this in the page because i i didn't put it in there yet i was so busy finalizing the whole thing last night late last night but it's three attempts and then after the the first attempt if you're going to do another attempt um it's six percent will come off uh, the your uh, grade. So by the second attempt, you can still get an A on the paper, you'll get 94. But then once you get to the third attempt, more points are, are deducted. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're studying, you want to make sure that you're careful with how you answer the questions. Yeah, it's, you do, do, do cry. <laughs> I understand, but I can't give you unlimited attempts or multiple attempts without penalty, because then the person who gets it right on the first go around is going to be upset because they're like, the person who got it right on the third go around is getting the same grade as me, which isn't fair. Right? Honestly, sorry, it's the loss <laughs> of details, but I do not know the undo on the quiz. What did you say? The, uh, it's the loss of details before that, even we like you know, studying the test, like you say one by one details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah, really... so please study. I know that a lot of people treat this as, oh, it's open book, it's open season, it's good times, we don't have to worry about anything. It's open book doesn't necessarily mean that that's easier. In fact, having to page around looking for stuff could be harder. So please study, go over the homework. I told you the questions are very similar. Um, you know, ask me for help, not on the test itself. I can't help you with that. But I mean, if there was a homework, that you were struggling with and you now realize that it's going to come up on the test i'm happy to do whatever you need for help i have office hours starting you know in 15 minutes if you want to pop in but there there is a penalty for doing um multiple attempts so six percent falls off after the the first attempt if you go into the second attempt and then six percent falls off at the, by the third attempt so you know if you're really struggling and you're taking multiple attempts and so on in the end um you know you you will lose some points uh, so make sure that you try to just know what you're doing from the get-go and then definitely there's uh, points deducted on the on the quiz I mean it's four options a b c or d you also have three attempts but by the third attempt I, you you the maximum grade you can get is 60 percent six zero because by then I mean it's like you've already chosen three different answers so I can't give you 100 percent okay so please don't go into the quiz thinking oh I'm just gonna like you know choose options and see what's right because unfortunately you'll find that um, your grade will drop precipitously by guessing um, and this is all to encourage studying and not guessing all right um, so I know some people might be mad because it's like ah, I don't want any points to be deducted but I have to help you by encouraging you to study by unfortunately using the stick approach and not the carrot in this case um, question Emdadul and, and then we'll dismiss why oh, sorry why couldn't you just get a like option, like do it right now and do the other half test like later on? Why is it like- That's, to be, like, that's uh, one, that's not how the system works. So there's a there's an actual technological problem with that. It doesn't, there's no pause button 
one. Two, that's not how the world works. When you guys come back to reality and, and the CPA exam and all of that stuff, you're not going to be able to come and go and come and go. You're going to be sitting and doing the thing in one shot. And it's our responsibility to make sure that you are practicing for the future that you are building, not you know for convenience. So, um, so we got to create conditions that are similar to what you would be facing in this class, but also in future situations, all right? I know, I know, but that's what I got to do, okay? Okay, anything else? Otherwise, we're out of here, folks. Anybody else want to ask me something or you're good? We can leave. Yeah, you're dismissed. I'm a minute All over. Right. I owe you a minute. Okay, so have a good day. I've got everybody's attendance. Thank you. I've got everybody's Thank attendance. You, you're welcome. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. And Jaron, you, you can come. Jaron, you can come to the um, office hours. Yes, yes. yes Professor. You want to come to the office hours, hours, right? hours, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you okay. know so where to, to find this office hours. Office in hours in yeah, I know that, ma'am. Okay. 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 okay, okay. Thank you. All right. All right.